everyone, it's Eiji, and today I will be talking about Ozami Dazai, his work No Longer Human, and also the manga adaptation of No Longer Human, which was created by Junji Ito. I read the books for the Classics Community 2020 Reading Challenge and also for the 2020 Year of the Asian Reading Challenge. I think I bought the novel back in 2018 and just didn't read it and so when I found out that a manga adaptation by one of my favourite mangakas was coming out I felt immediately motivated to pick it up. Before I start I would just like to give a trigger warning because the content of both works is very disturbing. It involves mental illnesses, abuse, suicides, attempt at suicides, sexual abuse of minors and just a lot of depressing subject matter. These elements are heavily entwined in both books so I can't not talk about them in this video but as you know I will always try my best to do so in a manner that is respectful. I had first intended to make this video about no longer human solely but I found that it is rather almost even impossible to talk about this novel without talking about the author. Osamu Desai is fairly unknown outside of Japan but he is actually one of the most popular Japanese authors of the 20th century. He's best known for writing No Longer Human and The Setting Sun. Osami Dazai was born on the 19th of June 1909 as Shuji Tsushima in Kaneki in the northeast of Japan. His family came from humble beginnings but quickly rose to power and thus became a well-respected family within the region. Growing up his mother was ill and his father, after becoming politically more involved, was very much absent and so he was mainly raised by his aunt and the family servants. Dazai's father passed away a month before he started high school in 1923. Four years later, he enrolled at Hirosaki University at the literary department. His few literary successes, however, were brought to a hold when his idol Akutagawa committed suicide. At this time, Dazai started to neglect his studies and started spending his allowance on clothes, alcohol and prostitutes. His situation did not improve and in 1929 he committed his first suicide attempt. Then subsequently, after running off with a geisha named Hatsuyo and eventually marrying her, his family disowned him. He later on tried to commit suicide again, but this time he did it together with a bar hostess. They tried drowning together, but only she died, so Dazai was charged as an accomplice. His family, however, intervened and got the charges to be dropped. After this, Dazai settled down and he became incredibly productive and started using the pen name Osamu Dazai. In 1935, however, he tried to commit suicide again and three weeks later he was hospitalized for acute appendicitis. In the hospital he got addicted to painkillers and after a year of trying to fight the addiction he was sent to a mental institution. He stayed there for a month and in that time his wife cheated on him with his best friend. When he found out he and his wife decided to commit double suicide. They tried to overdose on pills but both survived so they decided to divorce each other. After that Dazai quickly married a middle school teacher named Michiko. During the second world war Dazai was excused from the draft due to chronic chest problems and so he continued his writing. After the war is when he reached the height of his career. In 1947 he published The Setting Sun which was about the post-war decline of Japanese nobility. This work was inspired by the diary of one of his fans who he actually fathered a child with. At this point Dazai was an alcoholic and met a widowed beautician called Tomie. He subsequently abandoned his family and ran off with this beautician. This was also the time when he wrote his last finished work, No Longer Human. On the 13th of June 1948, Tomie and Dazai drowned themselves in the Tamagawa Canal. Their bodies were found six days later on what would have been Dazai's 39th birthday. More than 80 years since its publication, No Longer Human is regarded as a Japanese modern classic. It's also the second best-selling novel after Kokoro by Natsume Soseki. The book consists of three notebooks left behind by the main character Yozo Oba that are sandwiched between a prologue and epilogue of an unknown narrator who managed to get a hold of these notebooks. 
The book is narrated in first person by Yuzo Oba, who recounts his life from early childhood up to somewhere in adulthood. Oba is a troubled man who has always struggled with revealing his true self to other people, and therefore he decides to create this facade for himself made out of jokes. Really, the only way that he manages to cope in life is just by clowning all the time. What is central in this book is that Ober believes that he is disqualified as a human, or at the very least in the process of becoming a disqualified human. Actually, the original title, Ningen Shikaku, directly translates to disqualified human. In various ways throughout, he explains exactly why his situation is causing him so much pain and misery. It is something he sees as intrinsic about himself. He even talks about being born with these 10 misfortunes which cause him a lot of agony. Oba fears people and he feels to understand them, what exactly it is that makes them tick. I still have no understanding of what makes human beings tick. My apprehension on discovering that my concept of happiness seemed to be completely at variance with that of everyone else was so great as to make me toss sleeplessly and groan night after night in my bed. It drove me indeed to the brink of lunacy. I wonder if I have actually been happy. I am convinced that human life is filled with many pure, happy, serene examples of insincerity truly splendid of their kind, of people deceiving one another without, strangely enough, any wounds being inflicted, of people who seem unaware even that they are deceiving one another. I find it difficult to understand the kind of human being who lives, or who is sure he can live purely, happily, serenely, while engaged in deceit. Human beings never did teach me that obtruse secret. If I had only known that one thing, I should never have had to dread human being so, nor should I have opposed myself to human life, nor tasted such torments of hell every night. As a result of this lack of understanding, he is left feeling alone and isolated. All I feel are the assaults of apprehension and terror at the thought that I am the only one who is entirely unlike the rest. Having read quite a lot of Japanese literature, I have come to find that the theme of conformity is a recurring one. More specifically, what happens to an individual if they are not willing or not capable of conforming to what society deems acceptable. Opa feels like he's not capable of conforming, so as a last resort, he turns to clowning. He states that this was his quote, last quest for love I was to direct at human beings. He makes it very clear that this is a selfless act, as he states that he offers this version of himself to accommodate others, doing so at the cost of excruciating efforts from within. One consequence of this effort is that he gets taken advantage of. His childhood was marked by his abuse by family servants. My true nature, however, was one diametrically opposed to the role of a mischievous imp. Already by that time I had been taught a lamentable thing by the maids and manservants. I was being corrupted. I now think that to perpetrate such a thing on a small child is the ugliest, vilest, cruelest crime a human being can commit. But I endured it. I even felt as if it enabled me to see one more particular aspect of human beings. I smiled in my weakness. If I had formed the habit of telling the truth, I might perhaps have been able to confide unabashedly to my father or mother about the crime. But I could not fully understand even my own parents. To appeal for help to any human being, I could expect nothing from that expedient. Ober believes that he doesn't have the ability to speak and act like a human being. And so to his great misfortune, his biggest problem is that he attracts people, especially women. As he enters adulthood, matters do not improve. He meets and becomes friends with Horiki, a man who helps him into a vicious cycle of drinking, smoking and sleeping with prostitutes. He gets involved with many women, leaving a trail of destitute relationships behind. It's also important to know that he did not only struggle with human beings. Early in his life, Oba became disillusioned by how many of the things around him were created out of practicality, rather than enjoyment in terms of art and nature. How often, as I lay there, I used to think what uninspired decoration sheets and pillowcases make. 
It wasn't until I was about 20 that I realized that they actually served a practical purpose and this revelation of human dullness stirred dark depression in me. Despite Ober's nature, there are still instances in his life where he has a slither of hope of actually finding happiness. These are, however, shut down rather quickly. It isn't until he gets admitted to the sanatorium that he believes that his transformation is finally complete, stating that that was the moment he was completely disqualified as a human. In this book, Obe is so brutally honest, which made it very easy for me to sympathize with and relate to him. Referring to life as groaning away my sleepless nights in a hellish dread of realities of life, it's clear that he is in severe pain. He is hyper aware of himself, even going as far as describing himself as gloom and taciturn, and meticulously tries to hide his true self from others. I was intrigued by how far Oba was willing to go to keep his facade intact. One of the most memorable moments for me in this book is when one of his fellow classmates sees through all of his tomfoolery and calls him out for it. The dread and fear that coursed through Ober's veins was palpable. It was very intense reading about how he was almost having a mental breakdown because of it. Reading this book and learning about Dazai's life, it is practically impossible to not see the vast connections that are in this book. A lot of the events in Oba's life also occurred in Dazai's, and this book thoroughly examines Oba's psyche, so it very much so feels like an autobiography. Since this is a very popular book, a lot of people have different opinions on it. There is actually a huge divide where on one side there are people who are able to sympathize with Ober and on the other side people who feel completely opposite. I think this is a very relatable or dare I say even comforting book if you're someone like the main character who doesn't really conform to society's norms or if you're someone who has dealt or is dealing with depression or anxiety. Those who as coping mechanisms have created this image of themselves which they may hope is a more palatable or acceptable version of themselves in order to present that to others. But yeah, I can also see how this content might be extremely triggering for people or that people might not be able to relate as much as others. Back in 2017, Jinji Ito made a horror manga adaptation of this novel and the English translation came out last January. It's an expansion of the novel where he uses elements of a specific kaidan from the Rakugo San Yute Encho that wasn't only a ghost tale but also explored human nature. Another piece of literature that inspired him was Kokoro by Soseki Natsume, which I mentioned earlier. The story is about a young man and a person he refers to as Sensei, who was his friend and mentor. I personally felt that this manga did a great job of showing the fear and dread that Oba was experiencing throughout his life. Where Dazai was implicit, Ito opted to be more explicit, which as an effect made it much harder to get through than the novel. He definitely used his art to amplify Oba's feeling of hopelessness. The translation at some points gets a bit wonky though, but luckily most of the text was taken from Donald Keynes' translation, which also happens to be this one. So in the end, the vast majority of the translation was very sound. I was also impressed by how much of the story the manga was able to encompass. For me, it almost felt like reading the novel twice back to back. That definitely shows how meticulous Ito went about this adaptation, because at least for me, it felt like he really captured the essence of the story. He also put his own creativity into it, subtly changing it into a ghost story. The trail of misery that Ober leaves behind also here is much larger than in the novel. Ito himself also said that he wanted people to understand that no longer human at its heart is a horror story. And I personally believe that he did a great job at showing that. I liked most of the creative choices that he made. However, at one point Ober's wife commits adultery and that is something that excites him. And I felt that that was a bit at odds with what type of character Ober was in the novel. 
But like I said, most of the choices I didn't mind. Actually, one of my favorite ones was the fact that he decided to intertwine Dazai's and Oba's life. So in the manga, they actually meet each other. Ito actually did an entire interview with Viz Media, who published the manga adaptation. It's on YouTube and it's very interesting to hear him talk about his creative process with this adaptation. If you would like to read the manga, I would strongly recommend you to read the novel first. I personally think I would have had a significantly less appreciation of the manga if I hadn't read the novel before. At the very least, I would advise you to watch the interview first. I do have to warn you, it does have a few spoilery things in it, but you will definitely have a greater appreciation of the work. Anyway, that is everything I had to say with regards to Osamu Dazai and No Longer Human. If you liked this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see you in the next video.